I want to move on to uh, other issues now, and I'll start with you, Peter, because this is a, a cracking development, I reckon. We've talked a lot about quotas in politics uh, over recent years, and it's mainly focused on female representation. Labor have a quota to get 50% uh, of parliamentary seats filled by women, or winnable seats filled by women. Now, I've always opposed this, but one of the reasons I've opposed this is because why should it just be women? Why wouldn't you have uh, then a quota for gay people, a quota for particular ethnic groups, uh, a quota for uh, doctors? I, I don't know. Where does it end? Well, we've, we've found out today that one proposal going to the review of the Labor Party suggests what Labor needs is a quota for, like, working people, for, like, real Labor Party people. Isn't that what the Labor Party is supposed to be? Well, it is, and I think this goes to the heart of a crisis that the Labor Party is facing. It's about its identity and its role in Australian political life. And I think quotas are... or the, the, the raising of the question of quotas is an indication that the party's thinking about who it attracts both as candidates and as members. And if you remember, it, back in, the, in 2005, when David Cameron became leader of the Conservative Party and was still in opposition, he set out to modernise the Conservative Party, and one of the ways he wanted to do that was to increase the number of women as candidates, the number of people from ethnic backgrounds who uh, could stand as candidates. And we see today in a Conservative government um, and a conservative, uh, on the Conservative benches in the House of Commons the fruits of that labour. No, so I, quotas, I see that as a Did he use quotas or not? I'm not sure whether he used quotas, but there were certainly targets that they wanted to reach in order to change the, uh, the, the complexion of the party. So I see this as a good sign. I mean, I know w we worry about quotas at times, but it seems to me that the Labour Party is taking seriously the need to rethink its role, to rethink its, uh, the contribution that it has to make to Australian political life. Well, and if it didn't do that, I think the crisis would deepen. Well, it's got to have a serious look at itself, uh, especially given what happened in the federal election. But, Gemma, this is the party of uh, Australian workers deciding it has to find a quota for Australian workers. It is bordering on the absurd. Well, well yeah, it is. But for me, it's a couple of things. It's, it's the, the manner over the matter. And, and by that, I mean great that they want to diversify people that they're drawing into the party. And I should point out that... The affliction of, 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 of groupthink in politics is one that, you know, hits all parties. But in this case, you know, great, uh, get more candidates from outside the union movement, from outside the party, you know, the, me the me mechanics of the party function. But the, 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 the fact that they automatically default to a quota system to do so is indicative of part of the problem because if you can't do so outside of being that didactic and that prescriptive, you've got a problem... With, with the fundamental structure of the party. You know, you and I have talked about this in relation to the other mob and gender quotas, Chris, you know, verbatim. Um, but I would say, again, more broadly, you know, all political parties need to draw people from outside of the, you know, whether it's a union movement or political staffordom on the Liberal side or the Conservative side or the activist side for the Greens. For the Labor Party, they truly do have this crisis of confidence going on. Big tick for saying maybe we do need to look more widely. But for the love of God, quotas are never the answer because what happens is you end up with people simply ticking boxes, not there on merit. Yeah, I agree with you, Gemma. Let's go to a member of the Labor Party, Nicholas Rees. Nicholas, uh, what concerns me about this is kind of the opposite, and that is that the people the Labor Party is saying it needs to go out and recruit or have a quota for are the people it's always supposed to have represented. I mean, it just demonstrates how far the party has grown away from its roots, uh, how far the political class has grown away from the mainstream when you need a quota for the absolute main cohort that your party was founded to represent. Yeah, look, I think we can all agree that uh, our political parties, uh, being parties that operate in a democracy, uh, should try and represent uh, a broad cross-section of the community. And, and I say that uh, just as much as the Labor Party as I do for the Liberal Party. You know, uh, on the Labor Party, people are very proud that Ben Chifley was a train driver and went on to be a, a great Prime Minister. Uh, and I think it's true in recent times you have seen a increasing uh, professionalisation of the political class. Uh, again, as I said, that's for the Labor and the Liberals. I mean, the, you know, the Liberals are stacked just as much with former advisers and sort of yeah. representatives from business groups. Uh, you know, they're just unions for, for, for corporate, corporate Australia, really. And that, that's the sort of funnel that um, they come from. And on the Labor side, you know, again, there's a lot of staffers there and a lot of people with sort of union uh, or union-affiliated 
backgrounds. And look, I, I agree, I think it would be probably... Both parties would be better served if they had a broader diversity of, of, of folks uh, in their ranks, in their parliamentary ranks. How do you get there? That's the, uh, that's the challenge. I actually think uh, quotas have been a good thing for the Labor Party uh, on gender. I mean, I think the, the, the proof of that is you just have to look at the Liberal Party and, and their shameful uh, performance on that front. And they, they're just not representative of the broader community because of that under-representation, systematic under-representation of women they have. Uh, as for the specific recommendation of Nick Dyrenfirth, who's a great, you know, labour thinker, he runs a, a John Curtin research centre, they do great work. Look, I'm not sure I'm quite with him on this specific recommendation, but I'm certainly very sympathetic with where he's coming very from. Wary. At the end of the day, the way wary. the Labor Party succeeds with working people is by putting forward policies that working that help working yep. people instead of helping hand, help them get ahead in life. Yeah, if you had some working people in the party, you might have won the election. Uh, the, 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 uh, the thing here here is, uh, Kel, that... Uh, I mean, Nicholas makes the point that all parties need to get a good mix of people in them. It's, yes, it's yes. true, but, but it also, it, it also is, it misleads because the fact is the Coalition has managed to keep a greater diversity of people in Parliament. I mean, the Labor always talk to the gender thing, but, uh, you know, the, um, the, the Liberals and Nats, Nationals have farmers, they have small business people, they have doctors, they have nurses, they have former police officers, they have former soldiers... Um, male and female. Uh, and that's what you need, surely, don't you? That breadth of life experience. And, and Labor's, Labor's lost that. The wider view of life outside of politics. And, and this, this suggestion is actually a protest against what Nicholas is talking about. The professionalisation so that you get someone mm. who goes into young Labor or young Liberals at university, then becomes a staffer, then mm. becomes a candidate, then goes into Parliament. And that wider picture of life, that experience, they just don't have. Neil yeah. Brown, in the current issue of The Spectator, has got a column in which he reflects on 50 years ago this year. In 1969, he was first elected to Parliament. And he's saying that Parliament was more diverse then. You had more. You had police been in the in the uh, Labor Party in those days. You had train drivers. Nicholas, it's a long time since there's been a train driver representing the ALP in federal parliament. So well, it, yeah. it's... And, and can I say, Neil Brown's expression is really good. He says the gene pool is too small in the parliament. And this is an attempt what, what, to that. One of the differences is that the, the union leaders... Union leaders don't come from the trades. In the old days, yes. people would come through the Labor Party and be union leaders and go into politics, but the person who was the head of the union was a shearer, That's like a... Mick Young, or was a train driver. The head of now the... the union leaders come straight from university and never get a never You don't have trade. to be a, yeah. a qualified well, electrician to head up the, 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 uh, the union that represents Well, them. Um, Ed Husick was well, uh, with the electrician's union. I'll have to check with Ed. I don't think he's a spark. So here's, a, here's, a, here's a fantastic uh, fact for you. Australia, in fact, Victoria, was the first place in the world where members of parliament got paid a salary for being an MP. That happened, I think, in the 1860s, might have been the 1870s. And what that meant was that uh, ordinary people uh, were able to uh, serve their communities in the parliament. You didn't have to be a person yep. of, you know, independent wealth, if you like, yep. Yep. to be That's able to have the, that, the, the wealth that, to then, in your leisure that, time, serve the community. Yeah, so it was a great step forward for our democracy. We understand that. But, uh, so Victoria was really ahead of the game about 150 years ago. But tell us about right now, Nicholas. Is it still the case that all Labor MPs have to be a member of a union? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Yep, that's that's a very, very long-standing uh, yeah, principle it's rather extraordinary, of, isn't it? of the party. It's rather extraordinary, isn't it? You cannot represent the Labor Party in Parliament unless you are a member of a union. Well, no, it, I mean it reflects the history of the party and 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 the ethos of the party, which it is you know collectively, the collectively body. people working together uh, are stronger than individuals. And yeah. I mean, Chris, you are very on one-eyed let's in get, this discussion. I've got to say, I mean, you just, seem to be suggesting Nicholas, that the Liberal Party's got this wonderful diversity of backgrounds, and you know as well as I do that yeah. they've got a long way to go, all not right, just Nicholas, in gender, but in terms of professions as well. Chris, come on, Nicholas, I listed off. You can list off all the various professions in the. Labor Party, uh, send it to us. We'll put it up Doctors, on the website. Nurses, but, but the Liberals, officers, the Liberals have got a great, former people have served the great, army. Exactly the same as you there. could. But if you could just be quiet and, and let Gemma uh, speak for a moment, because she was <laughs> going to uh, take you up on that point uh, of, of MPs oh. having to be unionists. Because Gemma, well, as I you just... would know, as a small business person, of course, what unionists uh, represent what less than one in one in five workers in this country. What is it? 
10% or something like that, give or take 10% of the... And I think my observation on, on, on Nicholas's comment is that how can it be representative when the union members, union movement in, in general is no longer representative of Working Australia or Australia in general. Two other things I want to want to comment on that in that regard. If, if an organisation cannot give people the free choice, if the Labor Party or any other party, but in this case we're talking about the Labor Party, the Labor Party cannot say, you can be a member of this party whether or not you are in a union, then there is something fundamentally wrong because at the end of the day, that's my choice. My experience with the union movement was as a 14-year-old checkout chick at Woolworths at the Floriot Forum here in Perth, I didn't get a choice. My pay was docked automatically. I found out about it later. I was automatically signed up to a union I knew nothing about and didn't want to join. So don't tell me it's all democratic and the ALP is representative. And the other thing, the other thing is this concept of working Australia. The ALP stands for working Australia. You're telling me that conservative voters don't work, they don't understand financial stress, financial struggle. Clearly, there is an image problem. And if you can't, as again, I'll come back to that point. If you can't say to people, you are welcome in this party, whether or not you're a member of a union, you've got a problem.